Okay, everybody, welcome back to the online video lecture series for Philosophy 102 Ethics. Uh, this is going to be lecture video 8, and uh, in this video and this week uh, as a whole, we're going to be looking at the third, and in some more detail, um, at the third element of utilitarianism that we've yet to cover in much depth, and that is consequentialism. And so we're going to say a few more, we've talked about consequentialism briefly, but we're going to say a few more things about it, and then this week is really going to be devoted to um, applying consequentialism to a specific ethical issue, and that ethical issue is the ethics of euthanasia. Um, okay, so let's start out by taking another look at utilitarianism and specifically consequentialism. So just to review, consequentialism is the idea that when you're evaluating whether an action is good or bad, the only thing about that action that matters from a moral point of view is its consequence. So for instance, you might say here you are and you know if you if you perform some action, that action of course comes with some outcome, there's some consequence that's produced by it. But of course there's also various other aspects of that action as well. There's likely some motive that um, that caused you to act in the way you did. You had some, a selfish motive or a selfless motive or um, you know any sort of variety of motives that you might have. And then you might also have what we would call an intention. There was some goal, there was some aim that you were attempting to bring about. There was some purpose behind the action. And so what consequentialists say is that, uh, well, yes, every action comes with a motive or intention. There's some reason you did what you did. There's something you were trying or attempting to accomplish. Um, there's a consequence that you wanted to bring about. When we're looking at what whether the action itself is good or bad, the only thing that actually matters is the outcome. And in philosophy, this has been a controversial claim. Uh, and to sort of get a handle on, on why this is, let's take a look at the following example that Mill himself discusses in Utilitarianism. So when he gets to this, I, he gets to this point, um, he, and he starts discussing, okay, well, does Utilitarianism require you to always act with a motive of concern for the your fellow human beings? Do, does it require you to have a motive of wanting to help or benefit as what we've, we've been calling the sea of humanity? Because if it did, that would be rather demanding, right? It's quite difficult to always be motivated by concern for other people that you don't know, that you never met. Um, and so that would be a quite a demanding standard. What Mill says is actually no. Right, the right action is, of course, what benefits the greatest amount of people. But from a utilitarian point of view, it doesn't actually matter what your motive is. If you do an action that benefits the greatest amount of people because of some selfish motive, then great. If you do an action that benefits the greatest amount of people from a selfless motive, then that's great too. And this is the example he uses to make this point. So he says those who make this objection they mistake the very meaning of the standard of, of morals and confound the rule of action with the motive. And here's the example he gives. He who saves a fellow creature from drowning does what is morally right, whether his motive be duty or the hope of being paid for his trouble. Okay, so what do we imagine here? Well, uh, compare the, t the following two cases, the following two hypothetical, hypothetical examples of you saving someone who's drowning in a river. So first, beneficent rescue. You're walking along the river, you see someone drowning, and out of the goodness of your heart and your concern for your fellow human being, you save the drowning person. Okay, so that sounds great, right? You, um, you, you had a kind heart, you had a generous heart, uh, you wanted to help your fellow human being, you went in the river and saved them. That sounds great. Compare that to self-interest in rescue. You are walking along the river and you see someone drowning. You jump in the river and save them, not at all because you care whether they live or die, but simply because you want to receive the praise of your peers. Okay, now when we think about this, we might say, well, you know, the motive or intent behind that action isn't quite as pure, as, as, as sparkling from a moral point of view, as it was in Beneficent Rescue. Yet for all that, if we're consequentialists, we'd have to say the action in question here, and the action just is jumping in the river and saving the person who's drowning. We'd have to say the action in question here has exactly the same moral value. The person in each of these cases did the morally right thing. Now, that's not the entire story we can tell about this. 
Because the consequentialists can still say, well, there's still some difference between these cases. The difference is in the action. In both cases, the action was morally right and morally good. But there is a difference in the people involved. And one way to think about this is ask yourself, would you rather be friends with the person in, in Beneficent Rescue, or would you rather be friends with the person in Self-Interested Rescue? The answer should be pretty clear. Right? You would prefer to be friends with uh, someone who is willing, who has a kind heart, who's willing to go out of the way to help others, who would be there for you if you were going through a hard time. You wouldn't want to be friends with someone who just did nice things because they wanted to be, they, uh, wanted to be praised. And so from a consequentialist point of view, while there's no difference between the actions here, there is a difference in the moral character of the persons. Because if you think about the person in Beneficent Rescue, um, it's much more likely in the future that they would continue to do good acts, acts that create the greatest happiness for the greatest number. But the person in Self-Interested Rescue, it would be much less likely. It would only be in rare circumstances where they saw that doing the right thing also helped themselves. But all this is still to say, while we can draw this distinction between moral characters of people, the actions themselves for a consequentialist are exactly the same because they have exactly the same outcome. All right, now with this in mind, I want to turn, or start turning, I, I should say, toward the topic of euthanasia. And I want to look at and examine how a consequentialist, how a utilitarian, would look at the ethics of euthanasia. And before we get into it, there's more to explain here, well, you know, what euthanasia is, what are the different kinds, all that. Before we get to any of that, um, I want to start with this question, and I'm calling it the contribution to death question. So here it is. When is it morally permissible to contribute to the death of another person? So from a moral point of view, when is it okay to um, contribute to another's death? And the first question you should ask is, well, what, Ryan, what in the world do you mean by contribute to the death of another person? So here's what I mean by that. You contribute to another person's death when you fail to do something that would have prevented their death or when you perform an action that causes their death. So if there's something you could do, but you don't do it, and if you would have done it, it would have saved their life, we'll say you, you contribute to their death. If you perform an action directly that causes, in a direct fashion, another person to die, you've also contributed to their death. So the question is, when is it okay to do that? And to think about this, here are seven, seven different cases in which we would say the person involved contributes to the death of another individual. Case one, murder. X fatally shoots Y in an act of revenge. Case two, self-defense. X fatally shoots Y in an act of self-defense. 3. Euthanasia. X, a physician, administers a lethal injection to Y, a patient near the end of her life who's suffering great pain, um, at the request of Y. 4. Life support removal. X, a physician, removes Y, a patient in a persistent vegetative state, from artificial life support at the request of Y's family. 5. Bomber pilot. X, a bomber pilot, bombs a building which contains Y, a high-value tar enemy target. Killing Y is essential to, com to combating a dangerous terrorist organization. However, X also realizes, unfortunately, that doing this will cause a certain number of innocent civilian casualties. 6. Hiroshima. X, an American bomber pilot, drops an atomic bomb in the city of Hiroshima during World War II. The purpose of the bombing is to force the Japanese government to surrender by directly attacking innocent civilians. 7 not giving to charity. X, a reasonably well-off person living in the United States, does not donate the $3,280 that the Against Malaria Foundation can use to save the life of one person. Instead, over the course of, of the year, X ends up spending the equivalent amount of money on minor luxuries, coffee, eating out, going to the movies, new clothes, etc., etc., plug in whatever you want. So, these are all different ways in which you can contribute to the death of another person. In some cases, it was a direct intentional action. In some cases, it was an action you took, but you didn't necessarily want to cause all the deaths you caused. And in some cases, you literally just didn't do anything. Right? There was something you could have done, but you didn't do it. So there's a wide array of different ways in which we, we could contribute to another's death. But also, if you look at this list, probably your intuition is, 
not all of these are morally equal. Now, you can disagree on the details of the cases, but most people will agree that some of these are morally wrong, and some of these are morally okay. And we might disagree about which ones fall in those categories, but mostly we want to draw some distinctions. And those distinctions are, are going to be important. And to show you why, I'm going to start off by comparing a couple of these cases. So let's take a look at 5, Bomber Pilot, and 6, Hiroshima. Now, in Bomber Pilot, we have a pilot who uh, bombs a high-value enemy target, and when that pilot bombs a high-value enemy target, the pilot knows that there's going to be a certain number of civilian, innocent civilian casualties. Now notice, when the pilot does this, the pilot is not intending to kill those civilians. You could imagine the pilot saying, I know this operation has to be done, and look, of course, in any real case, you can argue, well, should it be done or not? But put that point aside. The pilot might say, well, I know this has to be done, and I also know it's going to cause a certain number of innocent civilian casualties, and I think that's a very unfortunate thing. I wish those civilians did not have to die from this action. But now go to Hiroshima. In this case, you can't really say in the same way that the civilians who died were just a sort of unintentional side effect or byproduct of the action. And that's because in 6, the direct intent of the bombing was to, to kill civilians in order to force the Japanese government to surrender. So in case 5, there's a sense in which, one could argue, the death of the civilians is unintentional, whereas in 6, the death of the civilians is intentional. And this is one very important point, because unlike consequentialists who think intentions don't matter, some people will say, no, intentions actually do matter. And this could be one of those cases. Okay, so that's one pair of cases, and you can see one way in which you might distinguish them. One other thing I want to highlight here is the difference between 1 and 7. So this is probably, and look, a lot of this will depend on um, what you think about the arguments we looked at last week from Peter Singer about obligatory charity, but the vast majority of people would look at 1 and 7 and they would say even if 7 is morally wrong, even if you think it's wrong to not give to charity, that 1 is worse. Right, that directly murdering someone is worse than not donating the money that you could to save another person's life. And so why is this? Well, what is in fact the difference? Now, you could maybe tell a story about intention here, but another way you could talk about this is that, well, there's a difference in the behavior involved. In case one, the murderer will say, had to directly move his or her body in such a way that would cause the death of another person. But notice what bodily movements, what behavior was involved in case 7. Well, regarding giving to charity, nothing. Right? In fact, every time you just sit around and do nothing, instead of, I guess, going on to the Against Malaria Foundation website and, and making the proper donations, we might say, you're in action, you're doing nothing, is contributing to the death of another individual. So if we think, and some philosophers would argue this way, if we think that one is worse than seven, one way to explain that is there's something worse about actually doing harm than there is about just allowing harm to happen. Okay, so the first point is we see there's various ways in which we can draw distinctions in these cases. And philosophers have some fancy names for the theories which we use to make these distinctions. So first, one doctrine we're going to be talking about this week is called the Doctrine of Doing and Allowing. And we'll abbreviate that as DDA for short. And what does DDA say? It is worse to do something that causes death than just allow death to occur. To occur. So this would apply to the difference between murder and not donating to charity. It's worse to actively do something that brings about death than just sit back and do nothing and allow death to happen. So that's one theory you could use to make distinctions between those cases. Another theory, and this deals more with the intention side of things, is called the doctrine of double effect. And this is just a very rough explanation. In a future video, I'm going to go into more detail on the doctrine of double effect, which is abbreviated DDE. Um, but basically, the doctrine of double effect says the following. If there's some action, 
that has both a good consequence and a bad consequence, you're only allowed to perform the action if the bad consequence is foreseen but not intended. So under, understand this, let's go back to bomber pilot for a second. When the bomber drops that bomb, he or she knows that there is a good outcome of that action and a bad outcome. The good outcome is um, harming the high value enemy target. The bad outcome, of course, would be the civilian casualties. The doctrine of double effects says that is okay as long as the civilian casualties are not intended, as long as they're just a foreseen side effect, something you know is going to happen, but something that you wish wouldn't happen, something that you are not intending to bring about. If there was some way of just har harming the high-value enemy target without harming the innocent civilians, then you would take that route. So that's the doctrine of double effect. Now again, that's a rough explanation. We're going to go into more detail in a future video, but hopefully that gives you some sense of these two theories. And another way to think about it is, there's really three different ways of distinguishing these cases. You could just be a consequentialist where you say the only thing that matters is how many lives are saved, how many lives are lost, or what is the overall happiness produced, and then you're only looking at the outcome. You could agree with the doctrine of doing and allowing, where you think, no, it's the behavior that matters. Did you act or did you just do nothing? That's what matters. Or you could agree with the doctrine of double effect, and you say, could say it's the mental state of the person acting that matters. Is that person trying to bring about a bad outcome? Or is the bad outcome something they're not intending, something they don't want to happen? All right, so hopefully as, as we proceed, the difference between these two theories will become more clear. Um, and the reason I bring these up is because both of these theories, the doctrine of do doing allowing, doctrine of double effect, and consequentialism, are all going to be very important for the issue of euthanasia we're going to uh, start discussing today. And so let's dive into that. So first, let's get a sense of what euthanasia is. So the word euthanasia itself, it just comes from the Greek for a good death. And it's usually an intentional um, bringing about of someone's death who's near the end of their life, who's suffering pain. Um, it's usually done, it would be requested in, in a medical context um, and performed by a physician or nurse. Um, now, th this is somewhat changing, but in most states in the United States, euthanasia is illegal. And in the reading that you did uh, for this week, well, one of the readings you did for this week by James Rachels, he, he gives the following example of a, a case of euthanasia. So we'll call this patient with throat cancer. To begin with a, fami a familiar type of situation, a patient who is dying of an incurable cancer of the throat is in terrible pain, which can no longer be satisfactorily alleviated, he is certain to die within a few days, even if present treatment is continued. But he does not want to go on living for those days since the pain is unbearable. So he asks the doctor for an end to it, and his family joins in the request. So here you have a couple elements. The patient um, is suffering pain. The patient gives consent for this to be done, requests the doctor to do it. The family joins in. So were this to be done, were the doctor to, for instance, give the patient a lethal injection, that would be a case of euthanasia. And just as a quick side note, we're not going to get into this too much, but um, it's worth distinguishing euthanasia from physician-assisted suicide. So euthanasia occurs when the healthcare professional, him or herself, actually would perform the lethal injection or the act that brings about the death. Physician-assisted suicide, on the other hand, is when the doctor or physician gives the patient the means to end their life and the patient actually does the act itself. But in this in this lesson we're going to be focusing on euthanasia. Um, let's, let's skip over that actually. Okay, so let's get into Rachel's article a little bit. So uh, Rachel's article, Active and Passive Euthanasia, probably the most famous philosophical argue, uh, uh, arg article on this topic and his main purpose, his main point in that article is to reject or critique the American Medical Association statement on euthanasia. So I, I have here the statement, so let's just read through it and sort of see, see what sense we can make of it. So here's what the statement says. The intentional termination of the life of one human being by another, or mercy killing, is contrary to that for which the medical profession stands, and is contrary to the policy of the American Medical Association. 
Okay, so first, I want to pause here for a moment. The statement makes a claim about what medical professionals are not allowed to do. And what medical professionals are not allowed to do is to intentionally terminate the life of one human being. So to intentionally terminate the life of their patient. And not only does the statement say they're not allowed to do this, it says that doing so is contrary to that for which the medical profession stands. Now that's a very interesting claim, right? Because if they're saying that terminating the life of a patient, performing euthanasia, is against the values that the medical profession stands for, then we need to ask ourselves, well, what are the values of the medical profession? What is the value that this action is going against? And you could give a couple of answers here, right? On the one hand, you could think, well, the one of the very critical values of the medical profession is prolonging life. And look, if, if you take that to be, for instance, what the medical profession is supposed to stand for, that one of their main primary criteria is to prolong the life of patients, then of course it would seem that intentionally terminating a patient's life would be wrong. It would go against what we're trying to accomplish here. Now on the other hand, you might say, well, of course prolonging life is an important thing, right? Modern medicine and modern nutrition have done an amazing job at prolonging lifespans um, o over the life of the human species. We have a much better life expectancy now than we used to. And everyone agrees this is a great thing. But is that really, one might ask, is that really the primary or core foundational value of the medical profession? Because on the other hand, one might say, well, the purpose of medicine is health. And that the only reason that a medical professional should be concerned with prolonging someone's life is insofar as that life is healthy, insofar as that life allows one to live a life that's pleasurable or happy or flourishing. And maybe it's not just the prolonging of life itself. So this is a discussion um, certainly that can be had further. Uh, but I just kind of want to flag this for you, this idea that th this part of the statement right here where it says that terminating the life is contrary to what the medical profession stands for, there's a lot more to be said about what the medical profession is actually supposed to be doing. Okay, fair enough. So that's the first part of the statement. Let's go to the second part. So the first part says what medical professionals are not allowed to do. The second part says what they are allowed to do. The, ces the cessation of the employment of extraordinary means to prolong the life of the body when there is irrefutable evidence that biological death is imminent is the decision of the patient and or his immediate family. So we're never allowed to intentionally terminate life, but the statement says you can take away extraordinary means of prolonging life if we know that biological death is imminent. And so what would we have in mind here? Well, we'd have in mind something like, suppose we have a patient who is on artificial life support. Suppose we know that their body cannot support their life on their own without it, um, and their death would be very near. The statement says you are allowed to remove that artificial um, means of supporting life. Okay, so this is what the statement says. And so what Rachel dislikes about this statement is that he thinks it relies on this distinction between active and passive euthanasia. He says the distinction between active and passive euthanasia is thought to be critical for medical ethics. The idea is that it is permissible, at least in some cases, to withhold treatment and allow a patient to die, but is never permissible to take any direct action designed to kill the patient. So this is how he understands what the AMA statement is saying. You are allowed to allow a patient to die by removing life support, but you're never allowed to directly kill a patient by, for instance, using a lethal injection. And he understands, in, in the way he explains this, is that the statement is relying on the difference between what he calls active and passive euthanasia. And he refers to the, um, the doctrine that the statement is expressing as the conventional doctrine on euthanasia. And We'll just sum up the conventional doctrine as the following. In some cases, passive euthanasia is okay. However, active euthanasia is never okay. All right, so this is the position he's going to argue against, and we're going to see how he argues for this. 
Um, but before we get there, we first have to do a little more work to explain what the difference is between active and passive euthanasia, because it's not quite as clear as it might at first seem initially. So the first thing to know is that the difference between active and passive euthanasia is entirely encapsulated in what is the method used to bring about death. So active euthanasia involves any direct cause of death, whereas passive euthanasia involves what I'll call doing nothing or having an indirect cause of death. So let's start with active euthanasia. This is the simplest one. Um, active, uh, Rachel defines active euthanasia as bringing about death through direct action designed to kill the patient. Um, and the easiest example here would just be giving a patient a lethal injection, right? That's the easiest sort of way to understand this. Passive euthanasia, however, is a little more difficult to wrap your mind around. Um, so I'm, I'm claiming that it involves an indirect cause of death or doing nothing. Now, doing nothing is a little easier to understand, so let's start with that side. So what do I mean by doing nothing? So let's say you're a doctor, you're a physician, or a medical professional, and you know there is some sort of life-extending treatment, there's some surgery you could do that would extend the life of a patient. There's something you could do that would prolong this person's life. And let's say you elect to not do that thing. Uh, let's say, you know, you talk to the patient, you talk to the family, they don't want you to, you decide not to. It is not done. In that case, you would have engaged in passive euthanasia. There's something you could have done, but you didn't do it, um, and therefore you contributed to the patient's death in that way. So, so far, we've seen that the AMA statement is saying, you're never allowed to do this. You cannot perform active euthanasia, no lethal injections. But it says you don't always have to save a patient's life, or let me put it this way. You don't always have to prolong a patient's life in all circumstances, right? If the individual's life doesn't promise any future flourishing or happiness, um, if they're never going to recover a sort of life they think would be valuable, then it is okay in, cons in consultation with the family, according to the statement, to just do nothing um, to stop treatment that would prolong their life. So that's one part of passive euthanasia. But what about this other part, um, indirectly causing death? What does this mean? What does it mean to indirectly cause someone's death? So here's the way I explain it. Some action A brings about the death of some person X indirectly if A, the action, and the immediate cause of the person's death are not the same thing. So you indirectly cause the death of another person if the action you take and the thing that immediately killed them or caused them to, uh, to die, if those two things are not the same. All right, now it's best to sort of understand this with some examples. Um, and in the medical context, the easiest example of this would again be the removal of life support. So if you give a patient a lethal injection, your act is the giving of the lethal, lethal injection, the immediate cause of the patient's death is also the lethal injection. So this is a direct cause of death. That would be active euthanasia. But if you simply remove the patient from life support, then it's not the removal itself that's the immediate cause of death. Right? You took an action that eventually led to that death, but it was actually something else that caused the patient's death. It's whatever their underlying pre-existing condition is. So whatever it is, um, that has put them in this position, their illness, their disease, whatever it is, that is actually the cause of the patient's death. So when you remove life support, you're only indirectly causing them to die. And look, so you might react to this and say, well, we're cutting all these fine distinctions. I mean, look, you, you remove the person from life support, you took an action, it caused them to die, why can't we just say that is a direct cause of death? So, the reason this is seen this way in medical ethics is based on cases like the following. So here's the case of uh, Karen Ann Quinlan. So I'll read through this and explain why it, it matters. In April 1975, this 21-year-old woman arrived comatose in New Jersey hospital after ingesting, ingesting drugs and alcohol. She was put on a respirator to assist her breathing, but gradually fell into a persistent vegetative state. Individuals in such a state are wakeful, but not consciously aware of their surroundings. Karen's parents wanted the breathing tube removed, but her doctors refused. The New Jersey Supreme Court 
ruled in March 1976 that, given her irreversible condition, mechanical life support could not be disconnected, even if it resulted in her death. The court ruled that this action was permitted on the grounds of a privacy right guaranteed by the Constitution, and that Karen's parents were the appropriate surrogates to exercise that right for her. Once the breathing tube, uh, once the breathing tube was removed, Karen unexpectedly began to breathe spontaneously. So, the ruling was that the breathing tube could be um, could be removed. Her parents or her family um, they decided that would be the best course of action, so they removed the breathing tube. And she unexpectedly just began to breathe. She was still in a persistent vegetative state. She was not conscious or aware, but her body was alive. And this was in 1975. She lived in that persistent vegetative state until June 1985, 10 years later, when all of her bodily functions permanently ceased and she was declared dead. So why does this matter? Well, this is why we, we, call, we call the removal of life support an indirect cause of death. Because it'd be very strange to say that in 1975, the medical professionals directly caused uh, Karen Ann Quinlan's death when her death only happened 10 years later after that action. That'd be very strange. I mean, the, you know, a perfect example of a direct cause of death would be a lethal injection or you know, the case of murder that we looked at previously. There's an action and then you know, immediately right away, the death is caused. But if you can take an action that only causes death 10 years later, we want to say, no, that's an indirect cause of death. There was something else that ultimately took her life, even if the action allowed that to happen. And so we would call that passive euthanasia. So just to recap, this is basically the outline of active and passive euthanasia. Active euthanasia involves a direct cause of death, such as lethal injection. Passive is either you do nothing, so there's some surgery you do that you could do, but you don't or an indirect cause of death, such as removal from, from life support. All right. Um, so those are the points I want to hit in this video, right? Just give you a sense of what the difference is between active and passive euthanasia. Um, in our next video, we're going to look at Rachel's argument in particular, and we're going to see how he argues for the claim that, in fact, there is no morally relevant difference between active and passive euthanasia. That whatever you think about active, um, you should think the same about passive. Right? There's no morally relevant difference. But we'll save that for the next video. As always, thank you for watching, and I'll see you then.